All right. Okay, folks, so welcome, welcome. As folks are just hopping in, I'm just going to, we're going to like thank Stevie for his intro <laughs> and we're going to visit him again a little bit later on. And uh, in the meantime, while folks are hopping in, we'll just, um, we're going to do a little bit of a land acknowledgement. I'll kind of go over what the outline of our day is going to be looking like uh, so you guys know exactly what to expect. Um, and then I'll introduce our chef for this evening. Uh, and we'll be getting ready to do some cooking, all right? So, um, Dallin, if you can please just uh, do our land acknowledgements, we will get started. Sounds good. Welcome, everybody. Um, so just to begin our session here, um, we live and work on the traditional territories of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe peoples, and are part of the Williams Treaties and Treaty 13. We acknowledge the Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation as our closest Indigenous community. Many of our practices, including our organizational structure, the seeds we plant, the foods that we prepare, the ways we educate and our methods of growing, harvesting, and preparing food came to these lands through the ongoing process of colonialism. We seek to hold this understanding in our interactions and engagements with this land and its people as we are all treaty people and we all play a role in truth and reconciliation. Thanks. Thanks so much, Dallin. That was awesome. All right, folks. So welcome, welcome, welcome to Food Stories. Uh, so this is our food story today, and this is with Chef Bashir Mounier. So just before we hop into uh, Chef Bashir, you can see he is in his kitchen. He is getting everything ready to go. Um, so this is going to be... Um, so what, what you can expect for this evening, we're going to do a demo portion first. So uh, Chef Bashir has provided us with a really great menu. It's going to be, um, he's going to instruct us sort of demo style to walk us through how we prepared this dish. Uh, but he has been so gracious to share all of the recipes with everyone. So um, at the end of this, this is going to be recorded. So it will be recorded and then shared out to the group. Uh, so you'll be able to follow along or just re-listen re again to, um, to our food story. And then you can also, if you choose, like cook along. So he included the recipes um, that you can follow and pick up your ingredients and then give it a try on your own to share with your family. So we're super excited about that. Um, what we're going to do is in this first half, uh, chef is going to walk us through uh, his menu. We're going to go through the recipes. Uh, he's going to show us how to prepare it while influxing some really uh, colorful uh, anecdotes and stories along the way. And then once the dish is all prepared, we get to sit down and dive into this um, man of the world. So Chef Bashir is of Somali descent, um, spent some time growing, growing up in Italy uh, and now has called Canada his home for the past 22-ish years. Um, I had the pleasure of doing one of his cook-alongs and I had such a blast. It was absolutely delicious and my family thought I was so fantastic. So I know you're going to enjoy this. I can't wait to dive in and to hear more about um, your style of cuisine, Chef, uh, what you bring to the table, literally and figuratively. Uh, I know he's much more than a chef. He's an educator, a food advocate. Um, he wears many, many different hats, a researcher, um, and all kinds of great things. So we're going to learn a lot about him today, and I can't wait to get started. Uh, so on that note, I'm going to pass it over uh, to you, Chef, to tell us maybe about the menu that you have prepared, and also maybe just a little introduction of yourself. Absolutely. You know, all the compliments you just gave me, I'm blushing. I'm not sure if everybody <laughs> can see it, but I'm sure that you can recognize that I'm blushing. I'm not used to get all this... Uh, fun compliments, but thank you very much. So good evening, everyone. I'm going to do an introduction why we are thinking about Indigenous people, Indigenous community, and a conversation around food sovereignty. I'm going to take a moment and introduce myself as an Indigenous person of Somalia. So Maga'id Wahawai Bashir Abdelkader West Munye, Wilke Hario Bashir, and Kabilka Wahawai Rehamar Yoshekal. So good evening, everyone. My name is Bashir Abdelkader West Munye. Wilki Hario Bashir means the son of Lul Bashir, 
Uh, so I'm taking my mother's name instead of my, my father. Although we come from a patriarchal culture, the woman that raised me and that taught me how to be a man, I want to provide a homage and respect to her. And Kabil Kega Wahawai Shekhal Yerhammer, and my tribe is uh, Shekhal and Yerhammer. So I just wanted to take a moment to introduce myself the way many indigenous people introduce themselves, but taking, uh, taking a moment to kind of reflect uh, on their own ancestor and giving uh, thanks to the ancestors as well. Um, again, like Maxine said, my name is Bashimonye. I teach currently at Joe Brown College. I love, love, love food. I'm telling you the lesson that I'm having this evening with all of you tonight, it's simple, it's delicious, and it's really culturally appropriate to me. Uh, what we are going to cook this evening is gonna be a Creole duck. I have like a beautiful breast from a duck, not too far from where you are, actually in Stouffville. A dear friend of mine actually took me to the farm. Uh, it's called the King Cove Farm, which is like the largest uh, ducking community in Ontario, if not all over Canada. I really love many of the practices that King Cove Duck does, so this evening I'm using that one. Um, we are also going to make a cornmeal uh, and buttermilk cornbread, and which is like one of my favorite all time because I can have it for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and if there are any reasons, any leftover, I'm gonna turn this leftover into little croutons. So it's the gift that keeps on giving. Um, and because I'm thinking the element of seasonality, I'm also gonna use some Swiss chard, which already started doing some cooking, and I'm gonna be doing some candied yams. So instead of like regular orange sweet potatoes, I already part cook my, uh, my sweet potatoes, which you can see the flesh, they're kind of like white yellowish. So it's not the regular sweet potatoes. This one's the texture tends to be firm. So, so before Bashir, we go just, any further, allow so me- So I, I, I just want to ask about the yams. So now are those African yams that you're using? No, those ones are Caribbean yams. Now throughout the Americas, there are yams that come like orange, yellow, purple, white, and anything in between. And they also have those ones that come, they call them like the Negro yams. The skin tends to be like really brown, tend to be a little bit fibrous outside, and the flesh is really, really yellow. So I absolutely love yams. So this evening, yeah, the skin, it is purple, but inside the flesh is actually whitish yellow. And I really love it because it doesn't really break down like regular canned yams. So before we go any further, the cornbread is gonna take 25 minutes. So let me show you how simple it is a cornbread. Okay. In this bowl right here, I have all my dried ingredients, which simply consists of cornmeal, flour, a little bit of a baking powder, baking soda. You can also add some nutmeg. You can add a little bit of a cinnamon. This one you can personalize, right? So those are my dried ingredients right here. And in here I have a buttermilk, two eggs, a little bit of a maple, and some clarified butter. That's how simple it is. So dried ingredients in one bowl, wet ingredients in the other one, just give it a nice mix. So do we, uh, you said you use clarified butter. Now do we need to use clarified butter or can we use melted butter to make this bread? You can definitely use melted butter. You can use some vegetable oil as well. You can substitute regular all-purpose flour for a gluten-free flour. Um, you can take away the eggs. So this recipe, it's a recipe that just keep on giving. Very, very simple. This really, nothing fancy to it. I'm gonna put this one in a container and we're gonna bake it inside the oven. So I'm just gonna rest it here for a second. Now, the beautiful thing about this recipe for this evening, there are different reasonings why I made a choice for this particular recipe. You know, as, a, as you hear the sound, it sounds very much like a soulful dish. You know, when you hear candied yams, when you hear Creole, you automatically tend to gravitate toward the part of the South. I don't like to call it soul food because although I'm an African descendant, Soul food specifically means uh, the experience, the lived experience of the African Americans that are descendant of slaves uh, in the particular states and regions, right? right? So my cooking technique that I'm doing, my comfort cooking, which my own history as a nomad, pastoral culture, as moving from one place to another place, adapting to those new environment. You know, the yeah. Creole experience, it reflect that the Africans have been enslaved through the Caribbeans. They moved to the southern part of the states, uh, met indigenous community, uh, 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 slave, uh, 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 slave owners, uh, and they come up with this beautiful combination of spices and seasonings that brought it from the continent, and then they use the local ingredients. So this mm -hmm. dish right here is much that intersection 
between locality and diversity. You know, most of the time when we think about local, we're always thinking about someone that doesn't necessarily look like me. And the food, when we think about local food, we're thinking very much about, oh, you know, asparagus and fiddle heads and ranks, which don't get me wrong, as a chef, I really love the elements of locality, but also makes me think about what about me and my own experience within the food scene. And when I'm cooking food, does this food also speaks about me? So that's how simple the cornbread is. Somebody please time me for 25 minutes because I can't get caught up talking and we don't want to burn this. Cornbread. <laughs> okay, we're going to be on it. We got, um, I'm going to ask Dallin to be on the timer. He will give you a wave when we're, um, when we reach that 25 minutes. But um, just before you move on, I just really appreciate that you gave us that sort of little um, uh, respect to the, the uh, African slaves of the American culture and just making sure that that was outlined and then sort of redefining sort of the food from your personal experience. Yeah, appreciate that. Absolutely. I, I think sometimes that the narratives that are not constantly spoke in a way that really gives a um, a position to uh, the ancestor, the people that actually build and paved the road for my own culinary journey. It would be so much for me to be able to take all the praise and the accolade for coming up with particular dishes, but I really have to take a moment to appreciate it for those that actually have walked and paved the road for me. Um, so again, tonight, cornbread, we're gonna have some steamed greens, we're gonna have uh, some candied yams, and we're gonna have uh, some Creole duck. In the meantime, I already have taken the stems and already started cooking the stems. You know, the stems, they tend to be a little bit more fibrous. The thing about I love, love, love the stems is that most of the time when people buy vegetables, they don't really have an understanding of the, ana the anatomy of a plant. So the stems have the same nutritional value. Some people peel the stems and the reason that they peel them is because they can be a little bit fibrous. But once you blanch them really nice and tender, there's really no need to peel them. So these ones have already been blanched and I have the leaves as well. I cook the stems separate from the leaves because mm -hmm. the stems are a bit longer and now I'm just gonna be simply blanching my leaves and eventually we're gonna just saute them with a little bit of olive oil and a little bit of garlic. Now, growing up in Italy, I ate food that really sounded like this one, like seasonal ingredients. You know, born in Mogadishu, Somalia, I'm really accustomed to food that within my DNA it speaks about cumin, coriander, cardamom, yeah. caraway. You know, if you will have to dissect me, all those spices are within me. But I really love sometimes the simplicity of just highlighting those ingredients. So mm -hmm. here's my steam. Okay, so I'm gonna do a little batch at a time so I don't really like it crowded. I wanna maintain this piece like really, really nice and fresh and vibrant. I also have a bowl with cold water. So once that I blanch them in this salted boiling water, I'm just gonna cool them off for a minute inside cold water. And after that, we blanch them, we're gonna pan fry them eventually. Go ahead. Yeah. So steam greens are here. Now, there's always this debate between Cajun and Creole. You know, Cajun is rooted in the Acadian experience. Creole is specifically spoken about the black experience. So that's the, some of the similarities and contradiction between Cajun and Creole. Now, I personally love this particular spice rub, but this evening I'm gonna share with you a little tip that I've learned over time on how to cook duck. And some of you will say, well, why are you using duck and why don't you use chicken? You know, I've been an advocate for farmers at farmer's market for many, many years. And because King Cole Farm is closed, a lot of restaurants uh, have not been purchasing from them. Yeah. And if you not purchase them, a lot of corporations like Loveless and Norfolk, you can buy a whole duck here from Ontario for $10 to $12. Mm -hmm. the grocery store, you can still buy the whole chicken for approximately the same amount of money. So pound for pound, I get more yield out of the duck than the actual chicken because the duck has a lot of a fat as well, right? Yeah. The anatomy is pretty much the same, but for me, there is a value perception as well. Yeah, you know what? I, um, shameless plug, uh, because I absolutely love uh, King Cole Ducks. It's one of my favorite farms. So if anyone um, has a chance to hop up there, it's just off of uh, Warden. If you go uh, north on Warden um, Avenue and you pass, it's past Bloomington. Um, 
uh, going like into, into Storeville, Stoville. Anyways, it's great. Absolutely fantastic. Um, Bashir, I have a, uh, just a comment. So um, someone's asking what can be cooked ahead of time and what should be cooked the day? Absolutely. That's a fantastic question. So, you know, doing your preps ahead of a time, it makes your dining experience even better. So you can definitely bake the cornbread in the morning. You can pre-bake or you can pre-braise your yams the night before. But I personally like a cornbread just like fresh coming out of the oven. So mm -hmm. now for your dinner, you can technically make the cornbread. I'm making a choice this evening to cook in front of you fresh because then my family will be enjoying it for dinner. Actually, if I can just go back for a second, if there's anyone who's Muslim or celebrate Ramadan, I just want to wish all of you Ramadan Mubarak, okay? So I'm fasting, so the time that we are having this cooking class, I'm actually salivating. So <laughs> you, know, the conversation, you can absolutely cook the cornbread the night before, but for me, I personally prefer the day of. You can steam or blanch your greens the night before, and then the day of, you can pan fry them, but I would strongly suggest specifically for the duck, most protein, you want to cook them right there at that moment because they only take eight minutes. So pretty much everything can be made ahead of time, except the duck should be cooked at the moment that you're cooking. So that's a great question. Thanks for that, yeah. So for my candied yams, I have my beautiful yams right here. I'm not sure if you can see the color. I have a little bit of orange juice, but I had some passion fruit kicking around. So I had a little bit of a passion fruit as well. You don't have to add it. I have a ginger. I have a little bit of a cayenne as well because the candied orange or uh, the candied yams tend to be a little bit sweet between the natural sweetness of the actual yam and mm -hmm. the orange juice as well. So as you can see, the sauce is starting to thicken for two reasons. One, because there's a little bit of a butter and B, because the starch content from the potato is thickening the sauce. So I, I'm, I'm almost to the consistency of a glaze. So I'm gonna stop the cooking for this one at this moment. I'm just gonna rest it on top of my stove. And when I'm closer to cooking or ready to have a dinner, I'm just gonna warm it up again, okay? So my candy yam goes in here. That looks amazing. I have been doing this dish for the past few months and there's been a whole inside joke because I started this dish right here for Black History Month. Mm -hmm. just the intersection between, uh, you know, my own identity as a Somali person, thinking about local Canadian ingredients, uh, and also reflecting on the experience of the African American community with the soul food. And um, I, I, during the month of January, I've been getting a lot of calls uh, to be able to do cooking and speaking around the Black experience uh, for Black History Month. Uh, but then I had to post a comment saying basically, dear community, Thank you so very much for all the wonderful opportunity of employment for the, for the Black History Month. Just remember that I will still be Black in March, April, May. Kindly employ me then as well. So that's the has been going on for the whole month. But uh, I really love this dish right here because you can simply remove the duck and you can use a piece of chicken. You can use, yeah. fish, you can use a cauliflower and the list goes on and on and on. I'm using mm -hmm. protein, animal based this evening, but the dish can be fully, fully vegan. So those are plenty of options that you can do with this particular dish. Yeah, and I appreciate like, so you made the, the, the distinction between um, Creole and Cajun um, with the Acadian cooking, and then as uh, the slaves from, like descendants of slaves from African American uh, cuisine. So um, did you, would you be able to just expand a little bit for folks about what what is Acadian cooking? Like, what, what is that culture? That culture right there is specific, specifically from, like, the French cooking. You know, there's, like, an Anglo-Francophone base uh, in the southern part of the States, specifically in Louisiana as well. And when you hear the French water, there's a so, so celebrated in New Orleans, uh, where the people that were, you know, French, French descendant, uh, they have taken part of the States, uh, and they have brought their own... Uh, uh, cooking techniques, uh, but then they use the slaves uh, to provide a uh, depth of flavor for their boring food. So that's the difference between the Acadian and the Cajun as well. Now, because of the, a lot of the African descendants, they had a lot of spices and seasonings and condiments, things that really provide a lot of a flavor. Um, they use this recipe by calling it a blackening. So this is one of the terminology that is used to cook this technique for the for, for, the, for, for, for all the spices. Now, I personally don't like to really pan fry the duck per se. 
I like to actually show you cooking it on a low heat on the stove top and then finish it in the oven. Many times when people do the blackening, they pan fry the, the meat, whatever, pork, chicken, fish, you name it, at such a high heat, they actually burn the spices. Yeah. And I find that it's not really desirable. So I'm gonna show you this evening a little technique that I've learned that it's like absolutely fantastic and you're still able to get a tons and tons of flavor. So here's the duck for this evening. So the duck is gonna take eight minutes. Uh, the, the greens are really pre blanched them. So I cook them in salted boiling water, refresh them in nice water just to be able to maintain the chlorophyll so they can stay nice and vibrant. And now I'm gonna strain them as well. Fantastic. Yeah. I'm also, I had some leftover yams. I'm taking some of those ones and I'm gonna bake them for my family as well. Because what I'm cooking this evening just for the show, but my family, they're gonna look at me at the end of the night, they're gonna be saying, where's our show? <laughs> Learn over time to ensure that whenever I'm doing a cooking class, to ensure that my family are privatized as well. Just a little bit of olive oil in here as well, just to use it, you know? A little bit of salt, and that's how simple it is, okay? Now, I have a lot of seasonings on the duck, that everything else for me, I just want it to be like sweet, textural, and soft. Okay, so I'm not looking for any extra heat on this one. So when you're putting the yams into the oven, what temperature do you have it at? I have now my cornbread baking at 400 degrees, and I'm cooking my yams because they're really being pre-cooked at 400 degrees as well. So I'm gonna check them again about four to six minutes. I really want them to get like a beautiful crust because the yam is like super soft inside. So I'm looking for a textual contrast. That's why I'm cooking them for about six minutes in a high heat. Perfect, yeah, that sounds great. Now, Maxine, what did you grow up cooking and eating? Oh, so we're, we're turning the tides here. <laughs> so, um, how about stuff? go ahead. <laughs> well, I grew so I grew up actually in um, an, a small suburb outside of Montreal um, called Tampon, and uh, it, uh, my parents are both of Bayesian descent, so they're both from Barbados. And um, and last time Bashir and I were chatting, we learned I learned that his wife is also from Barbados, so we had that in common. <laughs> um, so yeah, so when we grew up, uh, we were in a, like a French neighborhood. It was like my brother and myself. And so my family, my parents liked to cook a lot of traditional um, Bayesian food. So I have memories of going to like fish markets down in the Saint Laurent neighborhood. Um, and also uh, just like going to like butcher shops to get like pig's feet and oxtail. Um, at that time, I might not tell you guys what year that was, but at that time, um, those are when those cuts were like really inexpensive and it was something like really common, um, you know, for, for like Caribbean folks to find in that area. But to be honest, my brother and I, because we were like one of the only uh, Caribbean families in that neighborhood, uh, until much later on, uh, we just wanted like whatever everybody else was eating. So there's my mom making her stew and putting her yams and her edos and everything in it. Uh, and we're wanting heavy tom pea soup out of the can, right? So, <laughs> so shamelessly, I, I, I accept that. But since then, um, you know, like the, I've just been influenced from all the different places I've worked. And then definitely in the, within the last handful of years at York Region Food Network, where we're just exposed to all sorts of cultures, um, it's just made like such a huge difference on uh, sort of learning about that. Yeah. I, I, I love to be able to be in different neighborhoods of Toronto. There's such a beautiful thing about it because you can go 15 kilometers from where I am, eight kilometers from where I am, and you can constantly find the beautiful, beautiful food from so many parts of the world. I think we have like over 159 languages spoken in Toronto only, you know, so the yeah. amount of deliciousness that is from block to block, it's unbelievable. You know, one thing that I've always uh, argued with many people that I've personally learned is the definition of authenticity. You know, many times people, they're very, uh, they, they want to cling on to a time, you know, so they use in terminology, this is authentic. Because I lived in Italy, and Italy, it's a country with over 21 regions, if you, including Vatican State. From region to region, the food it changes and it varies, right? So such thing as authentic Italian cooking, it doesn't really exist. 
you know, it, and it's the same thing with the Chinese cooking. You know, most cooking around the world, just like if you say Caribbean food, there are a lot of uh, subtle similarities, but the food is constantly changing. So the food that used to be 100 years ago in Toronto, it's not the same food that we're eating right now. You know, the food that used to be 100 years ago in the Caribbean is different from one, the one that we eat right now. So it's important to reflect that the authenticity, it has a time and place. But there is authenticity with ingredients. So growing up in Italy, you can only call Parmigiano Reggiano only if it comes from a particular area in Emilia Romagna, close to Parma, from a particular cattle that they eat and pasture on particular grass. So that yeah. would be So it's the same thing with many other cultures having authentic ingredients to reflect on their own uh, regionality, but such a thing as authentic cuisine doesn't really, really exist. I think it's constantly evolving and it's constantly changing. And it's a subtle balance, balance between honoring, maintaining those traditions and also being okay that as the time progress, our food will inevitably change as well. You know, and, and that's such a key point. And especially for folks uh, like us who live in, um, in Toronto right now, where, you know, like our, our hands have touched many different regions. Um, and so, you know, through our travels, especially as a cook, like we have opportunities to work in multiple places all, all throughout the world. So you definitely have this influence um, of all these different cultures. And then going back what you're saying about ingredients and even being authentic, it's amazing like how those ingredients travel um, from, uh, you know, from country to country to country when you're trying to find like the origins of certain things, um, you know, where we think, oh, this is like native to the Caribbean. Like for example, coconuts, you know, we're thinking, oh, this is something that's native to the Caribbean. You find it all over the Caribbean, but actually it's actually, they're actually native to India. Right. Like, so it's like Southeast Asia. So a totally different region. So that journey of how did that coconut get from here to here? Those are interesting stories in there as well. Absolutely. And you know what? The funny thing about it is like I was doing some studies and research around multi-ethnic African food. So one of the research that I've done for the past seven years here in Toronto is to try to figure out how can we maintain Toronto diversity food scene as dope and as delicious as they can be. And for me, it always starts from the source of the ingredients. So yeah. for a person of color who wants to cook food that is a culturally appropriate to them, which leads under the umbrella of a food sovereignty, the right for people to grow, uh, distribute, and consume food that is a culturally appropriate to them, while it's also ecologically sound. I looked around and there was really nothing that spoke to me. And as much as I love rutabaga, I don't know, well, love rutabaga. As much as <laughs> I grow to like and appreciate with a baker, it doesn't really speak to me. So mm -hmm. when I did my research around uh, what it's vibrant in here in the green belt, I found out there were a lot of farmers coming from the worst parts of the world that were growing food that spoke to me, such as the Black Creek Community Farm. Most people might have heard about the Black Creek Pioneer Village, but they don't know right above the village, there is actually the largest urban farm in Canada. And the Black Creek Community Farm, there are farmers that come in from diverse parts of the world, specifically African and Caribbean descendants, and they grow in okra, they grow kalaloo, they grow choy, they grow hot peppers. And to me, as a person, as a chef who comes from a diverse background, that food got me really excited because now I can eat food that is local, that is seasonal, but also spoke to me. So that got me really, really excited. I've done those research and I started to build recipes. FYI, I'm not really sure how many of you know, but Ontario is also the largest farming community of peanuts. And you will think that so many people within the global south consume peanuts from snacks to appetizer, to main course, to desserts, to sauces, and the list goes on and on and on. So being able to have this accessibility to food that actually is culturally appropriate to me, there's a lot of real excitement. So I encourage you for those of you who are looking for food, why do you want to support the seasonal ingredients, the element of locality, thinking about procurement within the local sources, think also who are those farmers who are growing this food. It's easy to go to a Loblaws, absolutely. And being able to find a lot of those culturally diverse food, but it would be even better if you actually know the name and the farm of the people that are growing the food that can make your dining experience really, really vibrant. Yeah, and you know, there's a number of farms um, that we can find like throughout York region. 
um, that that actually provide these. In in uh, York Region, for example, there's Judy's Tropical Garden. Um, so that's a great farm. I love this farm. It's just in Markham. It's off of uh, Steels and Reeser Road. And so they are of Filipino descent. And I love the story. The, 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 uh, the husband, Judy's husband, he used to be the lead farmer at Whittemore Farms, which is also like on Steels uh, Avenue East. And uh, so, you know, once Whittemore's was closing down, they purchased their own farming property and then started questioning, hey, can we grow some of the food that we're looking for? And as soon as people in the community started recognizing that, hey, these guys are growing food we want, they're growing hot peppers and all varieties of eggplants, like crazy amounts of eggplants and squashes and all kinds of really great things and peppers, they, um, people just started being like, hey, if you grow this, I'm going to bring the whole community to come buy and purchase this. So that's just one example. And I know, Bashir, you have a whole list of farms on your website um, and where they're located. Um, so we'll put your contact information in um, the chat so people can definitely go check it out. So I believe it's BashirMunye.com. Um, but maybe you want to share a little bit about like some of the other farms? Yeah, you know, so the first time actually many, many years ago, before going to the Black Creek Community Farm, there was a farm that I used to do a fundraising dinner called the McBean Farm in Mississauga by Q of Queen and uh, I think Highway 7. And to me, that was the first time that I actually had the opportunity yeah. to eat some of those a variety of eggplants, as we're saying, variety of peppers and tomatoes. I actually seen the most unexpected, peculiar vegetable ever. It grew in a vine. I'm like, man, look at that tomato. It looks so beautiful and luscious. And the woman say, that's not a tomato. It's an actual eggplant. Because the color of, the of this eggplant was red outside, right? Mm -hmm. So that, to me, really excited. Another ex exciting uh, farmers that I met over time, uh, they call the Potager du Canada. Uh, and it's a couple from the Maldives Islands. Uh, I don't know why they call it Potager du Canada, but they're from the Maldives Islands and uh, they grow the most delicious fenugreek ever. Plus they have mm. what they call high eggplants or those small like little eggplants um, or they call them like egg eggplants as well. Um, so yeah, between the fenugreek, that one and uh, a variety of other vegetables, was that I wasn't really accustomed to consuming, including bitter melon, which, uh, which also, um, uh, you know, which is also something that is consumed throughout the Caribbean islands, because you know, throughout the Caribbean islands, there are a lot of other Asian communities as well, predominantly Chinese, a lot of them in Jamaica, a lot of them Hakka. Uh, wow. One of my friend chefs, the one that I was selling earlier, Rob Chin, is right here, Chinese Jamaican guy, so I just want to give a shout out. I hope my friend Mary Matilda is there as well. Uh, I felt a bit nervous. You know, anytime that you have a chef, including yourself, Maxine, it doesn't matter how many years that I've been cooking, I don't know how many times that I throw down the same recipe, there is always a little bit of a nervousness because I'm like, <laughs> oh my gosh, if I mess up my cornbread. This guy's been doing this big talk now, cannot even cook one single cornbread. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed. So yeah, um, please check the website, find out how vibrant Ontario they can be. And I also want to take another second to reflect that, you know, as much as you hear me speaking about diversity, multiculturalism, I really want to bring it back that we are here on Indigenous land. And when Absolutely. we speak in passionately about diversity and multiculturalism, at times we tend to really negate the true experience of the first people of this land right here. So it's important that we appreciate what's going on here, but it's also important for us to be critical when we are speaking from a place of our ownership and entitlement that this is not actually our land and we are just guests around here. And, to be, and it's very important for us to honor and respect not only the land, but also to reflect and also fight for the policies that support the indigenous community across Canada as well. So that's something always really important to me. Yeah, no, and uh, yeah, thanks for bringing that up because, you know, it's something that uh, we are super passionate about as well at York Region Food Network. And keeping, keeping that in mind, when we talk about food sovereignty, when we talk about local cuisine, there's a whole culture of people who out shine us <laughs> and who outlived us for generations, thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Um, and so there's lots of knowledge and lots of learning to be had in those spaces. Um, and, uh, and like, it's important that we give 
uh, support so that those voices can actually be heard really, really clearly. So yeah, with you on that. Yeah, so there's like some really great, um, yeah, farms locally, Black Creek, like Bashir mentioned, is such a great farm. Um, they're doing wonderful things. And what I love is when you check out, um, when you hit up some of these farms, what's really awesome is that the people who uh, like go to these farms, you can get all kinds of knowledge and information just from the people who are there. Um, it's like there's lots of energy, there's lots of talking, uh, people are sharing ideas and recipes and hey, didn't you know you can eat this? So um, you definitely want to check them out, check out Bashir's website um, and uh, sort of like support the work that he's doing to promote these other communities. Well, All right, so Chef, what do we have happening now? Okay, so for some reason, I think there's somebody who picked my little garlic that I had left. And I'm not going to be hitting anybody around here, but the garlic that I had for my greens is gone. So I'm just going to freestyle and improvise, and I'm going to pretend that, that this is garlic, but I'm actually going to saute some shallots with a little bit of olive oil, and I'm going to saute my greens. Now, what's the timing for our cornbread? Um, Dallin, were you keeping uh, <laughs> were you keeping note? How, how are we doing on the cornbread? We were looking for, was it 24 minutes? Yeah, we're looking at about 20, 25 minutes for our cornbread. Um, yep. Yeah, the timer just went off. Okay, there we go. <laughs> I think because I have a people in my house like kind of like salivating, they can see how fragrant the smell of a cornbread is and like stop talking and just get that cornbread out of the oven. Um, so, yeah, so I love vegetables in general. You know, I grew up eating them and most of the time people don't really understand the botanical composition of a plant. So when you're looking into a vegetables, you know, most of the time people, they tend to throw away I will say at least 20% of the vegetables. And if you take that 20% of the vegetables over a period of time, then you really end up with a lot of a food waste. So this one single household multiplied by 7 billion people. So if there is a little bit of a food literacy and an understanding on how those plants are, it really helps you. So let's give an example. Let's give a simple tomato. Hey, don't forget to check the cornbread. Now I'm, I'm worried about the cornbread. <laughs> I smell the detector, my smell detector just said to me, you're almost there. Let, let's give it a try, let's, let's take a look, let's take a look. That's the chef's internal clock, right? Yeah, my cornbread, it's almost there, but it looks a little bit pale. So I'm gonna crank up my convection and it's almost there, I can feel it. Okay, let's look at our yams. Our yams also decided to get a little bit of a color as well. Okay, not quite there yet, but again, a little bit of a color. Mm -hmm. Okay, Now, you see these tomatoes right here, and you might say, okay, so I'm ready to take this tomato, and most of the time, people, they will take and throw away this part and throw away this part. And when you really think about it, it's like, what's wrong with this part? There's absolutely nothing. And except the little car right here that tends to be a little bit fibrous, you don't need to throw away all of that tomato. So I have a small paring knife. One second. I'm gonna use this one right here for now. Take the knife and just make a little core inside, you know? And all you have to do is just like minimize the amount of a food waste. So out of this whole tomato, now I'm just taking this amount right here. So if you just waste this part, it's different whether you're wasting like 20, 30, 40, 50 gram and over the years. So for us, we work already in the food industry and our numbers are so small, every single dollar, every single cent makes a big difference. But from an environmental aspect as well, that really, really helps. And for me specifically now during Ramadan, thinking and understanding how many people are experiencing and constantly enduring hunger due to a variety of the social reasonings, it really breaks my heart. So I really try specifically during Ramadan to minimize the amount of the food waste. So less talking and more cooking. So I'm gonna take a little bit of olive oil I'm gonna put it in my pan, I'm gonna reduce my heat down, and I'm just gonna saute my shallots. Now, I know some of you looked and it's like, wow, is that his definition of a little? I really wanna know 
what does it mean a lot? Um, olive oil is really good saturated fat. Um, obviously, you know, I grew up drinking olive oil. Perhaps I even use it as a cologne, a good one. You know, some, sometimes my friends are asking, hey, you know, you know, what kind of olive oil do you use in your home? And I'm like, listen, none of them really pay me to do any endorsement. So I'm not going to tell you any of the brand names for any of this olive oil. But the way I did my math was like this, eight to $10, it's my everyday cooking olive oil. If I want to do something really beautiful, I want to compose a salad, I'm going to add like maybe 12 to $15. When my in-laws are coming, then you know that I'm going to bring that 20 to $25 olive oil, right? So that's how I, I, I really want to grade uh, my cooking for the people that I love. Now, my shallots are cooking, okay? Medium low heat. I absolutely love stems just as much as I love the leaves. So I'm gonna start with the stems and I wanna saute those stems and add them with all this beautiful olive oil. Okay. This is a low, low heat. Okay. Taking the excess amount of water out. And go. add some salt, increase the temperature and the cornbread is there. Now, so we talked earlier about the cooking technique for the duck. We talked that although it's gonna be similar to blackening, I'm actually gonna start with a cold frying pan. And most of the time when you're doing chicken or so forth, you always see in chef like pan searing them on a high heat. I'm gonna start with a cold pan because what happened contrary to chicken, except some chicken, that has a lot of, a lot of effect. So I'm gonna start in a cold frying pan. This is my cold frying pan. And I'm just gonna take my duck, shake off the excess amount of the seasoning from here, rest it down in that cold pan, take my other seasonings and just coat the top, the bottom. Okay. Cold pan. My duck has been nicely seasoned. Okay? And because all of that fat on that duck, I want to render in a very low heat. Now, by rendering a very low heat, the duck fat is going to clear the oils and has all those seasonings. And I'm going to use all, all that fat and seasonings to provide a flavor to either my greens or cornbread as well. So the duck fat is the gift that keeps on giving. There we go. Thank you. Just one second, I'm going to wash up my hands quickly. You can ask me more questions. All right. So, um, Chef, I love to have um, duck fat just for my everyday cooking, and it really loves, like, potatoes, and it loves eggs. Um, do you reserve your duck fat for further cooking? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I had to, at one point, I had to stop. Because between January and April, I've been cooking so many of these dishes that, that I had like a bucket of a three liter inside my fridge, okay? But then I look at myself and I look at my little physique and I'm like, I'm like, all that duck fat is really, really great for you. So I took up the duck, okay? And I'm gonna show you how beautiful this is, you know, if you learn a little bit of a, you know, some of the butchering techniques. I have a few beautiful duck legs which I'm gonna use the same fat to cook my duck fat, my duck legs. In French, it's called the confit de canard, which means from the French word confiture, right? To preserve. Now, many cultures around the world, they do confit. You know, they do it with pork, they do it with beef and so forth, they do it with fish. So I just wanna make sure that everybody understand the confit, although it's a French word, most cultures around the world, they preserve their proteins in some kind of a fat and or salt. This is the other breast that I have. I have the two legs right here. And those are all the carcasses, which I'm gonna roast them and I'm gonna make a beautiful stock and then turn it into a soup, including the wings, which they tend to be really, really gelatinous. So I took every single part of the duck. I have the neck, I have the back. So neck is right here. And we're gonna play rock, paper, and scissors with my wife or who's gonna get the neck and who's gonna get the back. And this is all of the fat that I have left. I'm gonna dry that fat really nice, put it in a low heat pan, Put in a low heat pan, and just allow it to render low slowly. Eventually I'm gonna explain it, put it in my fridge whenever that I'm ready to cook anything. 
instead of using a $20 olive oil, I'm just going to use a little bit of the best bread. <laughs> Brilliant. I love it. Yeah. Um, no, I, my cornbread. Uh, no, I, I was just going to say, I like that the, the, the duck, you can use it in so many different ways. Um, and I like that you're utilizing it in so many, in all these different fashions. Now, I'm not sure if you can see, but how much oil is already there. Yeah. Okay. So you can see how much oil is already there. Okay. Got a beautiful color starting from the low pen. Okay. I'm going to turn it. Now, I really need you to be in a timer for like seven minutes. This duck right here, uh, yeah, I think maybe like eight minutes. So give me eight minutes on this duck. Okay. That's you, Dallin. Timer is set. <laughs> Comrade is looking good. The ants are looking great. The greens are smelling lovely. I'm going to call her here. Oh, Beautiful. Okay. okay. Comrade is going to rest now for a couple of minutes before I cut it. The duck is inside the oven. It's going to take approximately eight minutes. Our greens are done. Let's make sure that everything is off. Beans are cooling off as well. The duck is here in the oven. My plates are ready. Let's carry on with our conversation. Where can we start from? <laughs> well I love, I just, that, that menu is brilliant and it was, it looks really simple. Um, there's not a lot that has to go into it. Um, a little bit of, you know, a little bit of attention. Um, and I love dishes that come together so nicely. And I feel like if there, by any chance there's leftovers, it's going to make a beautiful sort of like leftover dish as well. So I, I like that. Um, so in the intro, I mentioned how you wear so many hats. So you're a chef, a culinary uh, professor. Um, you are a food consultant. You're a recipe developer. What, uh, which one of those hats do you like to wear the most? Which one do you enjoy the most and why? Well, the one that I wear, that I enjoy wearing the most is the head as a, as, a, as a parent and as a husband. You know, they are the driving force for many of the choices that I do in my life. If it wasn't for them, I'll be in a beach somewhere just like chilling. Like, you know, all this COVID stress has really been putting a dent on me. And if I didn't have them to really encourage me, support me and kick my butt to make sure that I can be the person that I can be, um, then it would have been really, really challenging for COVID. Now, I've been blessed and privileged enough to be surrounded by a lot of loving people. They give me a lot of the support. So that hat right there, it's my favorite hat to wear. I do also wear a hat as a full-time student at York University um, doing my last year for my Master in Environmental Studies. And that one for me has been really, really great because although I haven't been in school for so long, although I have the imposter syndrome where uh, I feel that academically, I don't have the same snap like I had when I was younger with a head full of hair. Um, I feel that perhaps my academic writing skills wasn't there. I've been supported and now I feel like, okay, many of my sentiments around my studies have been only about feelings and sentiments, but school really helped me to be able to have the language to articulate many of the feelings that I had. Uh, but the hat that I really enjoy on a weekly basis is for me, as a teacher at Joe Brown College, you know, I feel that uh, I feel that my own personal growth and experience, uh, uh, I'm able to share what I've, what, I've, what I've learned for the past 20 years. But mm -hmm. most of all, I also feel that I learned so much from my students. You know, mm -hmm. I do both the teaching classes online, specifically Sustainable Chef, the Slow Food Movement, and I do practical classes as well. And I have the opportunity to be surrounded by students that are like really, really not only intelligent, but because they come from so many parts of the world, their own personal life experience, it really enriches my own ability to learn, retain, and then being able to actually really articulate their own sentiments as well. So the head as a chef instructor is the one that I really, really love. I, that's a, something that I never really thought of to do as a career. Uh, so that's the hat that I really enjoy as, a, as an educator for students, because not only that I'm able to share my own knowledge and expertise, I feel very, very privileged to learn so much from them. You know, and that's key. Like, I think it, when, um, when we're in this position in which that we get to lead and, and that we get to share like what we've learned, um, if, you if, you're, if you're able to keep that openness 
and be able to receive all the learning that we can also obtain from the people that we're teaching. It's like everybody just uh, grows from that and everybody just excels from that. So I can definitely relate to that, yeah. Um, and so at George Brown, uh, what is the what is the course that you're teaching there, and what's your main role, like as far as like the culinary program faculty? So I'm at the bottom, bottom, bottom of the bottom, bottom of the podium. So I'm just a new kid on the block, been teaching there for only four years. Um, I started as a continuing education instructor, so for adults who love to cook as a recreational aspect, that was my first introduction in cooking in an academic setting, and I really enjoyed it a lot. Um, because it was very casual, relaxed for adults while we maintaining an element of a professionalism because this is not the type of a space that you can show up with your flip-flop, your t-shirts and your shorts or holding a glass of wine while you're cooking that maybe some of you, that's what you're doing right now in this moment. So <laughs> with the high academic expectation, the still wants us, to want, wants us to provide the best and excellent service, even if you're there as a recreational. So that was really a great stepping stone for me to be able to teach now to the full-time students um, at Joe Brown College. The classes that I teach are primarily foundational classes. So when students come in to school for the foundation of cooking and the first three to four semesters, I'm one of the faculty that provides them those initial foundations. Um, and I hope within the next few years, I'm gonna be also have the opportunity to grow. Now, like any other institution, as you know, they're unionized. So because at the bottom, bottom of the podium, um, I feel that I don't really have the same uh, voice like many other chefs, but I'm so privileged because within my nucleus, a small classroom, I'm able really to speak my truth to all of my students as well. So it is a really a blessing for me to be there at this moment right now, considering everything that has been going on, uh, but I'm really, really happy to be able to share my knowledge and expertise. And I'm also surrounded by like very, very, very talented chefs that have been there for quite some time. Yeah. Yeah, and um, so when you're when you're there, you're teaching these foundational classes. Sorry. Also, that I'm the. Only, I also tell you that I'm the only second black person there. You know what? And that's actually where I was going. So, because <laughs> I, 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 you didn't say it, but I had, I was, I had a strong feeling that that was the case. Um, so tell me, like, what, what is that experience like being oh, the only? Uh, like like one of the only people of color that is in this uh, dominated um, industry by sort of like North American culture. And also when you're teaching, because when, when I went to culinary school, and I'm sure it's the same for you and what you're teaching now, is taught through a very Eurocentric sort of uh, place. The foundations of cooking is taught from uh, like a French culinary perspective and you coming from all these variety of backgrounds like how do you feel that that translates in your class it is very very challenging so i'm going to give you one answer first so being the only first black person it's a place that i've played in my life most of my childhood so i was the only black guy in a private uh, uh, high school I was the first black guy out of a 600 students two years after women were accepted because it used to be an all boys school. I was the first black guy. So being the first black person, at times you feel that you're actually paving the road for somebody else, but there's a lot of emotional trauma for you to kind of endure a lot of the uh, racism within uh, early childhood education that has been indoctrinating me. So that was the first thing. The other thing is also as an educator. So as an educator, I'm privileged enough that not only that I have the knowledge and understanding of a classic French European cooking, but I also have a, a depth of knowledge around other cultural diverse cuisines as well. So when I'm giving you the example of the confit de canard, I can also reflect on how many other cultures that have a variety of preserved food. So the language that is used primarily from a very colonized space, it is French for all the cooking. Being also the first black person at Joe Brown College, you know, I feel that a lot of the students that come to me and they're like, excuse me, are you a chef here? And I'm like, yeah. I am, <laughs> why? I've never seen a black guy teaching this before. <laughs> no. Sorry, Bash Bashir, I'm just gonna interrupt you for one second because I wanna get onto that, but a few people are telling me the duck is ready. The duck is ready. So they're letting me know that the timer has gone. <laughs> 
you were talking, be talking, talking, talking. But this duck smells absolutely beautiful. Now, so, so this particular duck right here, duck is done. It's resting right here on this meat breaster. And I have some folks just wondering, what are the spices that you use on the dish, on, on the duck, sorry. Oh, those are okay, good. So again, so just, I just wanted to show how beautiful those ones look like, okay? Now, the seasoning, it's a family secret. So if I share with you, then, um, no. <laughs> so it's basically a combination of paprika, I have a little bit of a cayenne, I have a brown sugar, I have an allspice, I have a nutmeg, I have a little bit of a clove as well, I have a dry thyme, a little bit of a dry oregano as well. Very, very simple. You can find the thousands of recipes online. I'm gonna share with you my own recipe as well, but you can find a lot of recipes online. Now, I personally like a little bit of a hint of a brown sugar. A lot of people, they have all the dry spices pre-mixed, but the brown sugar, you add them toward the end. So then I don't, if you don't want that caramelization, then you don't have to have it. Yeah. Okay. So the duck is cooked. It's resting right here on my meat rester. And the reason that I'm resting it right here, primarily because I want all the juices to kind of like rest, chill for a moment. So when I carve it, the meat is really nice and moist and it doesn't dry out and it doesn't bleed all over the place. My spice rub, it's all there from all that oil. I'm not sure how much oil I was able to get out of this duck. Okay. okay. Um, so and out of so, a single breath. So while while Sorry, you're, I just uh, want to show you. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. I'm listening. Sorry. So while you're doing that, so um, Bashir's so, just showing us like how much oil actually gets rendered out from the duck, and that you can use it further. And so, and then I have someone just asking about what the best pan is to cook in the oven. Well, what I always say to people, the best pan is based on your budget. <laughs> you know, for a lot of people, it's like, what you eat on the 15th of the month is different than what you eat on the beginning of the month and anything in between, because it depends on your, your surplus for cash. Now, although I have this new kitchen right here, I'm using frying pan and pots that I actually had it from as a wedding gift for so many years. So if you have the ability to invest in one single pan, one good one, to do a lot of heavy cooking, it's great. I personally love cast iron pan because I can make omelets, I can make a bit of everything, French toast, steak, fish, you name it. So I really enjoy good quality cast iron pan. And like I was saying to you earlier, none of those companies and corporations are paying me to sponsor their product. When they call me and they say, hey, Bashir, we got a contract for you, I'll let you know which pan I'm using. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I like that. Thank you. Okay, so... Um... I, I was I, I was just wondering if we could, are you gonna do something now or can we hop back in? You were sharing about how the reaction to students when you come into, um, when they see you at George Brown College. So I'm just curious how, how that the rest of that dialogue plays out. You know, the dialogue goes in a place of um, being humble, being modest, or give them a sense of reassurance that you know, they are in a good institutional space. There are very, a lot of really good, caring teachers, but just like all institutions are really very much based on a very uh, large scale white supremacies. And sometimes people, they feel very uncomfortable talking about those things, but it is okay to call the black of spade black. And it's very okay to call all the institutions built in, on, a, on a white supremacy space. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, wonderful people who are fighting, advocating for equal equality, uh, for justice for everybody as well. So when I speak to my students, I let them know and understand that, that I empathize with them. I can relate to them, but I'm not in a particular place uh, to take away anything from all the chefs that are really trying very hard to make a beautiful changes within the food industry as well. More than ever, uh, whether, it's, whether it's driven by the Me Too Be organization led by women, but if it is led by Black Lives Matter, you know, a lot of people who are really, really have that natural desire to make changes. And I'm really excited about that, right? So yeah. as much as being a lot of a negative, a lot of a really difficult issues, a lot of a painful conversations, I feel very optimistic because this new generation are surrounded by people like myself, like you, and many other people in the food industry who are really standing up and fighting against this old, old system. The guy actually who built this particular system in the kitchen, his name was Auguste Escoffier. 
he was the father of the classic French cooking, and he came up with this beautiful book that chefs they use it as their own Bible. But himself had said that cooking and food should constantly evolve as time and place as well. So the food that we were cooking about 120 years ago, 100 years ago, has to evolve. And at the same time, the practices that we do in our kitchen. So if most of our cooking before was based on a very patriarchal culture where men are superior to women, where spaces before did not allow a gay man or a gay woman or somebody from the LGBTQ plus to identify themselves, now that a lot of a safe space in those conversations can be carried away. So I feel really encouraged. I feel very optimistic as well. By the way, those yams are looking and they smell outrageously delicious. I have a little bit of a time as well that I'm going to add it up just because I want to carry on and have the element of a continuity between the whole dish. Now, candied yams are ready, steamed greens are ready. I'm going to carve and slice a piece of a cornbread. I have my daughter in the kitchen hiding behind the counter. She's like, stop talking, give me the cornbread. So I'm going to get the cornbread ready for her. Let's see what this cornbread looks like. If it's been just a big talk about, oh, man, what do you think? Is it ready? I can smell it. You can smell it? Okay. Let's give it a moment. <laughs> I'm going to just smell it. I think we're all wait. Uh, we're all hoping or wishing that we could have a little taste as well. You know what? As soon as this COVID ends, we are ready to get together and have a beautiful meal together. You know, there's been a lot of people getting vaccinated and feel so encouraged. I had a friend of mine, a real dear friend of mine, and also Rob Chin, um, that was really reminded us about, you know, how a lot of the seniors are feeling really, really excluded. You know, they feel excluded. They feel a bit um, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, they were doing community gardens, we're doing farming, and now all of these places, they're closed, specifically like in a lot of like more rural areas as well, it took away a lot of the joy and the ability for them to stay connected, at least kind of like seeding and planting right now something to look for for the summer. So I really feel for some of those, um, uh, for some of those seniors as well. I think I put my pen upside down. Just bear with me for one minute. I know that some of you are laughing because it's like everything that he was saying is just happening right now. <laughs> yes, it's like your fears are being realized. <laughs> but you know what? You're, 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 you're pulling it off really good. You got the game face on. You're just going straight forward. Yeah, no, you're doing good. You're doing good. <laughs> The show must carry on. The show must carry on. You know, I, I especially with Rob Sheen and Maddie there, I've worked on a lot of a catering company. And you, as you know, thousands of stories that make you really pull your hair. So after a while, it becomes like a second nature. Fake it until you make it. No. Okay. So let's go on this plate because I'm, I'm ready to, what time is it? Because I almost feel that it's that time for me to break my fast. What time is it? Uh, it is 7.34 right now. Seven thirty. Another half an hour, but at least let me, let me play the food for you. Although I still got another half an hour. Okay, so cornbread. Now, you know people that can play in so many different ways. Um, but I'm gonna share with you tonight a way that I really enjoyed it recently. Okay, really nice moist cornbread. I'm just gonna put it like nice long slice right there. Put the rest of this cornbread right here. I'm gonna take my candy yams. Just maintain similar color, one here, and maybe one here as well. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna take the stems of the greens. Just gonna put them in like one, two, maybe another piece right here. Just some of the greens as well. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but there's a, so much vibrancy with Swiss chard, the candied yams. Everything looks like so kind of like brightful. Oh my goodness, look at this. Like, it seems like I almost planted it. <laughs> right? Almost planted, yeah. Almost that planted, you know, like candied yams, Swiss chard, the cornbread. It feels like really lovely and moist. Okay, let's, let's carve into this duck right here. And so when you're carving your duck, um, do you like to, do you cut from the skin side or the flesh side? 
I cut it from the skin side. I know some people, they cut it from the other side, but it's perfectly fine for me. Now, I also want to show you that the duck has been sitting. I can see some of the juices falling down. And I want to give you a really an idea of how much juice I was able to collect from resting the duck, okay? So that fat, that juice, a little bit of a time, is gonna provide a lot of flavor just for me to finish my plate. Very, very critical point after you have a beautiful piece of meat, just allow it to rest and then carve it. Now, I personally like my duck on a medium rare side, uh, so I'm cooking it between six to eight minutes because this is about a pound duck. But if you like your duck to be cooked a little bit longer, then feel free to do that. Those are my own personal preferences, but never judge uh, anyone who likes the meat to be cooked a little bit more. I'm just gonna, because I personally love to just get like one good juicy slice and then look inside and say, Bashir, you have all the money. I don't know if you can see the color. Boom, can you see it? right it's there. Like nice. <laughs> Spot on. Spot on. Impressive. See, you did well. You, just, you didn't let us down. <laughs> Spot on. I'm so, let you down. so happy. You know, I'm so happy. It all worked out. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I'm taking a beautiful spot here, and I have all this beautiful, the fat, you know, those natural juices from the rendering, just like to kind of like accentuate a little bit more of the plate, you know? Some of the cornbread, some of those lovely greens. I don't know about you, but this kind of feels really festive to me, you know? So, uh, cornbread, buttermilk cornbread, candied yams, steamed greens, uh, and Creole duck. Now, this is called the nomadic comfort food, a tribute to my own heritage uh, on my pastoral community. This is not so food. It is inspired by those communities, uh, but calling it so food, it will be cultural appropriation, although I'm an African descendant as well, because that's the experience of those communities. This is nomadic comfort food. This kind of really brings uh, to me at heart, my love and my joy from the experiences that I had in Italy, the ones that have lived in the States, uh, been here in Toronto for 26 years, married to a lovely woman from Barbados, uh, and all this movement about time and place really allows me to create a food that not only that is a vibrant and that is diverse, uh, but also speaks about the element of the locality. So local, seasonal, diverse food. Boom! Thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna give it to my daughter because she's like, she's looking at me with puppy eyes. So I'm gonna give it to her. <laughs> bon appetit. Enjoy. We, we, we kind of want to see her take a bite, but I think we'll we'll give her that privacy though. <laughs> that looks okay, absolutely Tisha, beautiful. Send it to Thank you. I'll take a picture and I'll send it to you. Please feel free to ask me more questions. Yeah. So um, Karen and Rob are just saying fabulous as always. So folks, okay, so that was our, um, uh, thank you so much Chef Bashir for just taking us through that menu. It looks absolutely delicious and amazing. Um, so up next, if you all have any questions that you want to ask, um, Chef Bashir is here and ready uh, to answer those questions. So, um, so if you have anything, you can type I it in the chat and then I will uh, read it out and he'll answer them for us. So we'll do a little Q&A time. Um, it's 740 right now. So we have 20 minutes that we can just kind of like chat it up, learn a little bit more about Chef and about his, um, his background and his culture. And uh, just to get it started though, I wanted to, um, I just was curious to find out what region in Italy did you grow up in? So yeah, I grew up in, a, in, a, in, a, in an area called Castelli Romani, which are the seven hills, uh, of the Pope resides one of them called Castel Galdolfo, and they're about 20 minutes from Rome. So I grew up in a, the region is called Lazio, uh, so about 20 minutes from Rome. So the neighborhood that I grew up, it's kind of like the Oakville to Toronto. I don't know if I give you the analogy. So it's like a nice little suburban area. So I live there about 20 to 25 minutes outside Rome. Okay, thank you. Um, I did have a question from somebody. Uh, so Noor was asking, uh, is there a one food ingredient that you do not like? So what's your, uh -uh, I don't like it. Hmm. Uh, you know what, I don't, 
I, I overdosed when I was a little kid in chocolate. So I don't get up in the morning looking for chocolate. I've cooked a lot of sweet and savory dishes with chocolate as well, but it's not something that I really, you know, desire to cook or eat. So chocolate is my little, the thing that it doesn't really work for me. Chocolate, I, is that a thing? I didn't even know that it existed. <laughs> I don't know if we can be friends anymore. That just like, <laughs> I love that though. So chocolate, you know what? Mine is celery. Don't like celery, I don't know. Don't but like it. Maybe, maybe, maybe you never had a good celery. You know, maybe you never had a good celery. I have a fantastic recipe where you have a stewed celery with, a, uh, with, a, uh, with octopus and it's absolutely delicious. It's based with tomato sauce, there is onions, there are olives inside there, there are a little bit of a raisin. It's like a beautiful, beautiful Southern Italian dish that I cannot tell you. I really put my nose up like celery, like, like everybody else. Oh, so <laughs> you know, you know, to eat it with some ranch sauce, but apart that, you know, nobody wants the celery. But celery is one of those really underappreciated, undervalued uh, dishes. And the celery leaves, they're beautiful, beautiful in salads as well. All right. For, I do like the celery leaves. And I, I think I appreciate the flavor of celery, but I don't know. There's something about the texture maybe that I, I just, I don't love. But um, <laughs> I have another question for you. Uh, I just have, uh, do your children enjoy cooking as well? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, my son, he has a couple things in his repertoire. Uh, he's more of like an academic guy. He doesn't really like cooking per se, unless he has to. Uh, it's like a very technical body. Uh, my, my, my daughter still like cooking, but why cook when you got a guy in the kitchen cooking all for you? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like the youngest <laughs> one loves baking as well. So she's a bit more adventurous. She loves baking. There is a whole baking set behind here. Uh, but why do you bother cooking when, you know, you can just place an order. It's like, hey, can I have some duck with cornmeal and uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. which sometimes really helps me as a parent and also as a cook, not to think about what they want. It's easy if they make a request based on what I have available. Yeah, you know what? And it's true. And if they like everything, then that makes life even that much easier. I, I bet. You know, I, I gotta say something to you because I know there's a Karen and Rob right there. And you know, the most challenging is like the, the kids of chefs. Those are the people that are most difficult to please because the parents, they can cook all bunch of food. But then your kids, they come back around and it's like, listen, why don't you just give me a balloon sandwich, okay? <laughs> your fancy stuff. Two slices of bread, put some mayo, put some bologna, and let all the other kids in school look at me like I'm one of them. Now <laughs> I'll build a glance of beef bourguignon. I don't want that myself. <laughs> I know. There's always something fancy in our, in our tool belts, for sure. Um, okay, I have a question. So anyone else, if you have any questions for Chef Bashir, please uh, put it in the chat. Um, but my question is, what is your favorite food memory? Do you have a favorite mood, food memory? I have a favorite food memory and I have a, uh, one of the most challenging food memories. So I'll share with you one of my favorite food memories. My favorite food memory, it's a Friday uh, coming out of the mosque. You know, you go to the mosque every Friday, there is no school. You go to mosque and after you go to the mosque, you go home. And every Friday, I love eating, um, they have like fresh goat, right? You have a liver, uh, you have this thing called anjera and malawa. Anjera is like a sourdough pancake, usually made out of sorghum. Uh, mm -hmm. No, it is flour. Ethiopian people, they have anjera called, uh, that is made out of a teff, which yeah. is an Green that is native to Ethiopia, but we use the sorghum as well. And then we have a malawa, which is a type of a crepe. So I have a beautiful fond memories of delicious food cooking up in my family home on Friday, specifically after mosque, eating liver from a uh, freshly slaughtered goat and mm -hmm. uh, having a cup of chai masala. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Somalia, it's a borderline, it's the furthest northern eastern corner of the continent. And we've been doing the trades with the Yemeni people and Indian people for thousands of years. So our food is really kind of like the Creole cuisine. We're talking about this amalgamation between Arab influence, Indian influence, and the Bantu and the, the Ethiopian as well. Plus the colonizers. So in my house, you might eat pasta one day, you might eat a basmati rice the next day, uh, and the next day you might eat it like chapati and parata and on and on and on and on. 
absolutely mm-hmm. a must in my home, in my life. You gotta have a side of a banana with any meals that you eat. So we are not gonna go and have dinner unless there is a side of a banana. Now, obviously I'm not gonna have it with buttermilk, cornbread and duck and steamed greens, but there are some other dishes that it's like so needed to have a little piece of banana, a little bit of a hot sauce and you know what? We, <laughs> that sounds great. We made, um, we were, I was uh, trying out some uh, recipes from our featured cookbook this month, which is called uh, In Didi's Kitchen. And we were making, and tell me if I'm pronouncing this correctly. Uh, oh, now I'm afraid to say it. <laughs> but it was like a chicken stew with coconut milk and tomato. Is it dag kumbe? Did I say that correctly? Yeah, yeah. You said it right. You said it right. The beautiful thing about her book uh, is showcase uh, a little bit of an East African flair as well. You know, from the northern region of Somalia, including Djibouti, which had their own independence from French as well. So there are Somali people that call themselves Djiboutian. Um, the food is really different versus the southern region as well, versus yeah. the northern region. Plus, people who primarily consume camel meat most of their diet. Because that kind of a pastoral life, they're consuming camel milk, camel meat, they have a variety mm-hmm. of, uh, of fruits and so forth. They don't really, they're not sedentary, so their food is not necessarily based on grains and starches and so forth. So that's, a, that's one of the perfect examples to show you uh, this coastline cooking, very much like the Creole cooking. It's a combination of these different spices from different people, including the food that they colonize and are grown. So there are, those are some of the that intersection, again, going back between the Creole dish from tonight and also from uh, uh, my Somali heritage as well. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Um, I have a couple more questions and a comment. My comment is we, uh, in Barbados, I remember as a child, we used to eat uh, banana also with our soup, like so a hearty provision soup, and we would always eat banana with it. And uh, like all the other kids in the neighborhood thought we were really strange but we thought we knew we had gold <laughs> happening. Um, so you're two, so I have a question, a couple of questions. So uh, one is, uh, what's your favorite part about teaching at George Brown? I think you kind of touched on it before. And the other question was, uh, what do you like to do in your spare time outside of teaching and being a chef? Uh, I don't really have a spare time, first of all, because, uh, you know, when you are, uh, Bottom, 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 bottom of the podium, you gotta constantly be in the hustle. So, part, uh, you know, having a lot of leisure time for myself, it doesn't really exist. You know, I have a family, so I enjoy having time with them. I have a dog that I take every morning for a walk, we take long evening walks. So I really enjoyed that. We had a dog recently for the past three, four months. Um, but when it comes about really what I do at Joe Brown College and what is the thing that I enjoy the most is that, you know, when the students, they look at me at the very beginning, they're kind of skeptical about my own knowledge because the association of a chef, they usually see a tall white guy, a little bit older, a little bit more plump, that it might have an authoritarian tone of voice. So when they see me, that I come with my swag, that I'm really relaxed, that I'm cool, that I'm polite and so forth, they're kind of like trying to challenge a little bit now. Um, after a while, when they see that I'm confident, knowledgeable and skillful, a lot of them, they feel like, oh, okay, this guy is, is one of us, but I think what I really bring to the table is not only my understanding of a very classic European cooking. I went to Durban College as a student. Um, I've worked in a lot of beautiful places from boutique hotels, French restaurant, to, to Karen and Rob. The, the Rob works for one of the best catering company in the city called Whitton Hall Manor. I had the privilege to work at this place as well. So I have worked really with a lot of beautiful, experienced people. But for me, what I really bring to them is like the element of a discussion between race, class, and gender to all of my students. And for them, when they're cooking food, to take a moment to look at the food and find themselves within the plate. Because it's so easy to get caught up in wanting to be this glamorous French chef. But if you're from Vietnam, you're not a glamorous French chef. You can become a glamorous Vietnamese chef. And if you're from Sudan, you're gonna become a fantastic Sudanese chef. And if you look at your own identity as a woman, and then I speak to you, then you're gonna take your own critical lenses and being able to challenge many of the institutional norm that are currently perpetuated in the food industry, right? Mm-hmm. If you are a young, young you know, lesbian girl in my class, then when I make you feel that it's cool, that you are who you wanna be, 
then that element of a safety net it is carried on and eventually is going to be led outside the door as well. So those are the things that I really take a pride and joy. I have students that call me a year, two years later. I have students that follow me on Instagram. And they really tell me the things that kind of resonated with them. And it's not necessarily the cooking skills. Pound for pound, I know th hundreds of cooks that have a much better culinary skills than me. But a lot of the students they didn't sign up only for the cooking. Many of the students, they sign up because they want to become something more than just like a, a practical cook. At least that's my desire for me for them. That's amazing. And you know what? I'm, I'm thankful for that you're there because I know when I went to culinary school, like, yeah, there was, there's no one that looked like us um, in that space. And you're kind of like out on your own trying to find what your space is um, in this place. Is that an empty plate you just got there? <laughs> I was letting you know there's one stem left behind it. I'm, I'm not going to be able to eat it right now, but I was letting you know that the dish has been enjoyed quite a lot. I think there is a couple of licks on the plate, but I'll take that too. Yeah, I would say so. That that plate is empty. That is very impressive. <laughs> um, no, you know, and uh, so I was just saying that. Yeah, I like it's great that you're there to be able to just um, be that face uh, in that space, because oftentimes that's something that's missing, and especially in this industry, the irony of that is for hundreds of years the faces that were only in the kitchens were faces that look like ours. And so the irony is now that we have to refight for that space that had already uh, belonged to us and also didn't have the same sort of like distinguished and esteem um, as it does now that we aren't the face. Um, so I always find that this, that juxtaposition to be something, um, just something to think about, something to think about. I, I love the juxtaposition that you just addressed. And then for me, I speak to a lot of my students because we have a lot of the theoretical classes inside the classroom as well. And um, that one is also very much based on the gender role. You know, when you look at who in most cultures do the cooking, by choice or not by choice, that tend to be women. But the ones that they don't get any accolade are women in the food industry when it comes about being a chef. You know, somebody recently had a conversation around became and nominated as the best female chef in Asia. And I'm wondering why is it a best female chef and not why just the best chef? You know what I mean? So the conversation goes always around that race, class, and gender when it comes around the food that we're talking about. You know, who are the people, as we we're saying, behind the scene cooking for us? But also, who are the people that are harvesting the food for us? Who are the migrant workers here in the Southern Ontario that come to those farms and come and collect food, right? What is their own personal experience? So as much as food can be such a beautiful, comfortable, joyous thing, when you look deep down, there can be other elements so that it can be a little bit more sore and perhaps many people don't know some of the complexity within the food scene i love food because it can be the vessel for us to be able to articulate it confront and address all of those issues that we're experiencing and people across the world have been experiencing for the longest time yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. absolutely you know um that's why i love food too i love to use it as that tool to have these conversations to bring out these these uh, discussions because you know once you show people some beautiful food and talk about ingredients everyone's uh open and receptive and ready and it's even better when we can actually provide that food for people and then share a little bit of that story and that history and that culture of that food uh with them so i'm just taking a look at our time chef and it is we have five minutes left and i just want to say a huge thank you for you um for being here today for sharing about you're sharing your recipes with us about your experience your knowledge and your culture um everything that you've brought forward to us has left us with things to think about things to smile about and uh and things to enjoy later on so it was just such a pleasure to, uh, you know, hang out with you this afternoon. And I look forward to when we can uh, be in the same space and like cook together one day. Absolutely. absolutely. Thank you so very much for inviting me to be part of this uh, special space as well. Um, is it possible, because I have some people that are really dear to me at heart, is it possible to open their camera I want to say and see if some of those people that are close to me are, oh, there, there they are. Oh my goodness, look at all these people. I didn't know that I had so many people that I'm really fond of. Hello, <laughs> everyone. Look at this, Noor so, yeah. and Rob. 
if you guys want to open your cameras and say a hi to Chef Bashir, you can totally do that. Everyone turn on your cameras. We're right near the end now. Um, and so feel free to do that. Give him a wave. If you want to unmute yourself for a moment, just say hi if you know him or if you just want to express your appreciation, feel free to do that as well. So, Wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Enjoy Thank it. You. It was great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm blushing. I, I'm, I'm I'm blushing. Sorry. 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 I see the Sorry. blush. I see the blush. <laughs> <laughs> the makeup is fading away. The makeup is fading away. Is fading away. I, I, I just want to say I'm so grateful for all of you who had the opportunity to share and listening to my own story. Um, I'm really looking forward for eventually for us uh, for me to be able to listen to some of your own stories as well. Now, my own knowledge and skills as a chef, uh, that's what I do for a living. But I can really be a good listener if you give me the opportunity uh, to listen to your own uh, experience as well. So for that, Maxine, thank you very much for having me. Thank you, all of you, and thank you to York Region Food Network for hosting this beautiful event. And I'm looking forward to hear all... Uh, I'm looking forward to hear and meet all of you at one point in life. Um, Maxine also will give you my Instagram page for those of you on Instagram, and it will share also with you my, um, my, my website as well. So you feel free to send me a message and let me know how your experience was. You will also get the recipe as well and have fun with it. Enjoy the recipe as well. So thank you, everyone. And uh, last, what's what's next for you, uh, Chef? Like, are you good? Where can, if anyone wanted to connect with something that you're currently doing, I know it's still COVID time, so it's challenging. You had your supper club in the past. Um, is anything coming up? You know what? For the next couple of weeks, I'm just going to buckle in down, finishing my York University thesis. So that's like what is taking a lot of my energy and time, but I'm super excited. Uh, but I'm planning in two weeks from now to restart my nomadic comfort cooking classes. So for those of you who enjoy it and you feel that, okay, I, I, I can see myself cooking with this guy on, on Zoom. He made it fun and, and uh, enjoyable for me. Uh, yeah, you can send me an email and I'll send you the dates for the next uh, Nomadic Comfort class. Um, I have a couple new recipe working out as well. So that's what I'm doing at this moment. For this moment right now, just like focusing on my school, um, uh, maintaining my own mental health, uh, enjoying my family moment uh, and just... Uh, staying alive okay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome so folks if you um have a chance you definitely want to cook along with chef Bashir. i'm usually on the instructing end and i appreciate it so much to be part of the uh like the like student end and he makes the classes really fun really easy he acknowledges everyone who is there um gives everybody a chance to participate and share and talk if you want to and tons of knowledge i'm sure everyone is heads are full right now from all the wonderful tidbits that we learned from chef today and so if you want even more of that you definitely want to check this guy out um and even just give him a follow on instagram we've been like kind of following each other back and forth for like at least a year or two um and we finally connected so um i'm so glad that we had a chance to do that if i can say one more thing before i go there's this jamaican guy with the glasses standing there with a nice haircut and now he's smiling finally this guy right here has taught me so much over the years. I know some of you that look as like, which Jamaican guy with the glasses? And it's right there, the one that says Karen and Rob. So <laughs> that, that right there. So Maxine, I'm not sure earlier I was telling you. So this guy right here, Rob Chin, is a fantastic chef. Uh, so not only knows everything about everything when it comes to my food, but he actually shaped a lot of my knowledge and experience over the years as well. So for that, I just want to say thanks to Rob as well. Amazing. Rob, thanks for being here. And thank you all for being here. You got a special shout out. So <laughs> um, it's been a pleasure. It's a great after evening. It's not afternoon. It's a great evening. Thank you so much for everyone who being here. A few people had to hop off. Most people are still here though, Chef. And uh, it was a pleasure. So folks, next food story is coming up. Oh man, I wasn't organized. Okay, so next food story Um is going to be coming up in June 17th. So it should be somewhere around June 10th or June 17th is going to be our next food story. Stay tuned to find out who our uh, guest chef is going to be, but much more the same. Lots of excitement, lots of interesting conversation, 
and uh, have an amazing night. Check us out, yrfn.ca, for any of our programs that we're doing. This Food Story series is part of our Food in History through a BIPOC lens uh, programming that we've been doing. And we are just, as we did today, sharing what those stories from Black, Indigenous, and people of color, what are those stories? And we are just journeying together to learn together. So on that note, have a blessed evening. Have an amazing time. Thank you again, Chef. Thank you all for coming. Um, and we appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Uh, I'm going to break my fast right now. It's 8.02. Good night, everyone. <laughs> Good night. Enjoy. Good, night. Good evening. Bye. Bye.